Welcome to another virtual Live Talks Los Angeles event. We welcome Suzanne Nossel and Jennifer Egan to our series. They'll discuss Suzanne's book, Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All. Suzanne is the CEO of PEN America, the foremost organization working to protect and advance human rights, free expression, and literature. As CEO, she has led campaigns for free expression in Hong Kong and China, Myanmar, Russia, Eurasia, and the United States. Her career has spanned government service and leadership roles in the corporate and nonprofit sectors. And she's also served as the Chief Operating Officer of Human Rights Watch and as Executive Director of Amnesty International USA. She's held senior State Department positions in both the Clinton and Obama administrations. Jennifer Egan is the author of several novels and a short story collection. Her most recent novel, Manhattan Beach, a New York Times bestseller, was awarded the 2018 Carne Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction. Her previous novel, A Visit from the Goon Squad, won the 2011 Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Critics Circle Award, and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and was recently named one of the best books of the decade by Time Magazine, Entertainment Weekly, and several others. She's presently also president of PEN America. Welcome to both of you. I'll let you take it from here, Jennifer. Great, thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here and talk about this book, which I have to say, I think could not be more timely. <laughs> we are in a moment where speech is so contested and I can just say personally that I found this book a, a great help to me as someone who seeks not to offend and to avoid conflict if I can. I felt that it gave me a kind of roadmap for how to try to navigate this very thorny issue. One of the things you talk about in your book, Suzanne, um, very uh, compellingly is context. And so I thought maybe, and, and we'll get to that in our conversation, but why don't we start by just hearing a little bit about your context and how your varied career has led you to become focused on this issue. Um, it would just be great to know about that. Well, first of all, thanks for, for doing this. It's a lot of fun to do it with you. Yeah, you know, my background, I have a legal training, a law degree, but I, I practice really very briefly. And most of my career has been kind of a mix sometime in the corporate world, in media companies, in government, in a couple of different stints, and then in non-governmental organizations working on human rights issues. And I would say when it comes to free speech, one of the seminal experiences for me was during the my time at the Obama State Department, working on United Nations issues. When I got there, I was sort of managing the US's engagement on human rights issues at the UN. And one of the very contentious issues on my plate was this resolution that a group of Islamic countries had put forward that sought to establish a global ban on what they called the defamation of religion. And it had grown out of the controversy over the Danish cartoons, those images of the Muslim prophet Muhammad that were caricatures and in, to many Muslim eyes, they were sort of seen as incendiary and a desecration of the prophet. And in the wake of that, there were protests outside Danish embassy installations uh, that led to lost lives. And there was a great deal of upset in the Islamic world over what was seen as an insult to religion and as disrespect for Islam. And so they brought a resolution at the UN to try to condemn that and even ban the defamation of, of religion. And they wanted to establish an international treaty that would have done that. And we as the United States were pushing back against that vociferously. We were marshalling votes at embassies around the world and working with allies in Europe and Canada and Australia. And we would go through this exercise twice a year, once in Geneva, once in New York, them pushing their resolution, us pushing back. And to me, the whole exercise seemed really pointless. I felt like they were genuine in believing that intolerance toward Muslims was on the rise. This was not too many years after 9-11. And they wanted to bring about a greater sense of respect and awareness of their religious sensitivities. And I thought that was a legitimate effort. And you know, on the flip side, the Western delegations led by the United States were trying to defend freedom of expression, you know, likewise a uh, central principle. And so my kind of instinct there was like, maybe there's a way that these two agendas can be brought together and maybe we don't need to be at loggerheads time and time again, kind of battling this out with no practical result that had any 
anything positive for people who are affected either by infringements on free speech or by anti-Muslim intolerance. And so we sort of changed tact in those negotiations and ended up proposing a different approach, which was based on the idea that there were ways of tackling intolerance toward Islam that didn't involve infringements on free speech, things like dialogue and education and bringing experts together and looking at how hate crimes can be prosecuted and a whole series of tangible concrete measures. And ultimately we got people together around an alternative resolution that embodied that and that both the Islamic delegations and the Western delegations could accept and that we could adopt by consensus, thereby doing away with this biennial exercise of kind of battling out at the UN over these issues. And you know, for me, that kind of sparked the interest in whether these battles over free speech may be perhaps more tractable than they sometimes seem to be. What kinds of speech freedoms, what, what does free speech mean here in America right now, I guess legally, and how is that different from other Western democracies? Yeah, I mean, that was one of the interesting things working on these issues in the UN context was recognizing that the US's approach to free speech is quite unique. And we are the most protective jurisdiction really in the world when it comes to limiting the authority of government to impinge upon freedom of speech. And that's because of the First Amendment and particularly the way it's been interpreted really over the last hundred years. If you look further back than that, it was interpreted much more loosely and courts upheld far greater restrictions on things like sedition than they would today. But Oliver Wendell Holmes brought an end to that about 100 years ago. And since then, we've had a very restrictive view of the ways in which government can limit freedom of speech. And in international law, actually, it's more permissive. There's sort of a three-part test in international law. It has to be in the public interest. It has to be clearly articulated, the restriction. It can't be too vague and it has to be sort of faithfully implemented. And if those criteria are met, then you can have a law, for example, in Germany that would ban Holocaust cost denial or require social media companies to uh, take down hatred from their platforms as German law currently does. Here in this country, those would violate the First Amendment. We don't have those that three-part test. We don't accept it and we actually, in, uh, in international law, we have a reservation against uh, the provision of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that enshrines that test because we take a more narrow approach to the per permissible limits of government intervention. And you know, there are categories of exception to the First Amendment. It's not that all speech is protected. And I run through them in the book and it's things like harassment, truth th threats, uh, false advertising, defamation, liable, but courts have been pretty restrictive in how those have been interpreted and they're quite well delineated. And you know, a lot of speech that can be banned and prohibited even in other democracies can't be here in the US. And you close your book with a, a section that is entitled, Know the Case for Free Speech. And I thought, why don't we just start with that in a way? What you've described a situation that is actually unique globally in terms of the uh, the protections of free speech in America. Can you give us a, a short version, uh, as you do in the book, of why this is a good thing? Yeah, sure. I mean, there are a series of rationales that have been advanced, you know, all of which I I would say I personally subscribe to and believe in. You know, the first is that free speech is, creates a kind of blueprint or backdrop against which the truth can be found. You could sort out truth from falsehood. If people are free to rebut, refute, bring contrary evidence, contradict, that that fosters a kind of give and take you know, from which the truth gradually emerges. But if you shut down or curtail speech, then there's the risk that falsehoods are reified, they can't be challenged. So that's one piece of it. And there's another element that really goes to individual autonomy and expression. And you know, we've seen a lot of these arguments come to the foreground when it comes to, for example, LGBT or transgender identities, things like don't ask, don't tell, you know, which I know you've written about, you know, really as an infringement on 
autonomy. If you can't express yourself and your identity, that your fundamental personhood is compromised. You know, there's also, I think, a strong argument, and I think it correlates with sort of what we've seen in our, what we're proud of in the United States, that free speech fosters a climate for creativity, whether it's entrepreneurship or the flourishing of the arts and culture, uh, invention, innovation, and that all those possibilities and sort of the dynamism of the society is fostered when you staunchly protect free speech. And I'm going to just um, quote you from the book, actually, to add one more point, which is, quote, perhaps the best argument against progressives seeking new restrictions on speech is a simple reminder of who, as of this writing, would have the power to enforce them. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the Trump administration is a really vivid illustration of the grave risks of asking or empowering our government to curb speech and affording them the discretion to do so. And you know, people sort of ask the question, shouldn't hateful speech be banned? Shouldn't racial slurs be banned? Shouldn't you know, uh, a professor who makes a sexist comment in the classroom be disciplined at a public university? And I, you know, I understand the rationale for that. And there are some instances where the speech in question may constitute harassment or another category of exception to the First Amendment. But when it comes to the argument that we should be more expansive in asking government to curb and curtail speech, we see time and time again, whether it's in US history or around the globe, that when you give government that authority, they use it in very self-serving ways. And Trump really offers the perfect illustration at, at PEN America, of course, we are suing the president for his threats and acts of retaliation against critical journalists and media outlets because he's had this persistent pattern of uh, needling and harassing journalists who ask him tough questions and actually in some cases uh, with, withholding their press passes, uh, engaging regulatory mechanisms to retaliate against their employers. And, you know, that's to me, an ab a clear abuse of the First Amendment. It's an abuse of government power to silence speech. You know, we've had a number of instances just over the last couple of months that we've been involved in of the White House trying to suppress the publication of books, uh, Mary Trump's book. Uh, in, in one instance, right before that, John Bolton's book. Now we have the case of Michael Cohen, who seems to be back in jail in order to to prevent him from writing a book or on, on condition that he not write a book. It, it, you know, this is this White House. They, they will do anything to try to su suppress criticism. And it's very dangerous to give them that authority. Luckily, you know, we, we still have a court system. We still have uh, institutions that have afforded us some measure of protection against his attempts to misuse that authority. But if that authority were, were allowed by the First Amendment, you know, just think of what the field day he would have. He would probably shut down media outlets, uh, you know, no critical books could be published. So it's a very vivid illustration to me of how things can go wrong. You know, we'd all like to believe that we could trust our leaders to exercise this discretion perfectly, but, you know, the whole premise of the Constitution is that uh, it, trust isn't good enough and that you have to create uh, clear legal parameters that limit the authority of government when it comes to speech. And, you know, I think that's extremely important. And, and if you didn't understand why before the Trump administration, I hope you do now. Yeah. <laughs> um, you describe the present moment in your book as a particularly perilous one for free speech as Americans know it. And you've just described how the Trump administration is trying to encroach upon our speech in all kinds of ways. What are some other challenges that are creating that state of peril? Yeah, I mean, I think there's another one that does relate to the Trump White House, which is really this sort of emboldening of hateful speech. And the Charlottesville rally was the most vivid example of it, but there are also so many examples of the president, whether behind the White House podium or in his tweets being derisive and denigrating toward minorities, toward immigrants, uh, toward people from different parts of the world, uh, you know, countries that he call, he, he uh, uses slurs to describe. And I think that has sort of emboldened the rise of hate speech 
throughout our society and also hate crimes. And we see statistically that hateful crimes are on the rise and that's documented by the ACLU, by the ADL. And what that has triggered sort of in response is an impulse to really clamp down on hateful speech in environments that people feel they can control. They sort of can't control what's going on at the White House and the president's abuses, but you know, when it comes to an individual campus or a publication or a professional society, there's a very strong sense that anything that is offensive cannot be tolerated. And you know, sometimes, to my mind, that goes too far and it can have a chilling and censorious effect on discourse about topics that we need to be able to talk about, whether it's a matter of history, whether it's, you know, what policy would be right in terms of police reform. You know, these are subjects that need to be debated. And there's a risk that when a contrarian position or even a question can be construed as hateful or on a slippery slope toward offense that, you know, we have a kind of chilling that sets in. So technology has, is, seems to be a huge factor, both in the, in the functioning of the Trump administration and the president himself, and also in this picture of, of perils to free speech. Can you talk about how technology plays into all of this, some of the ways? Yeah, I mean, on social media, there are a couple, Couple of things. I mean, first of all, we have kind of the, the weaponization of speech. And you know, one issue we worked on extensively at PEN America is online harassment and the fact that, you know, what might in the past have been made through a letter to the editor or maybe Suzanne, a snide remark we're, at a cocktail party now can snowball into mass online outrage that really has a, a much more powerful censorious effect. So if you say something that is, you know, perhaps offensive or objectionable to someone else, you know, maybe in the past you would have gotten a, a, a side eye look or a letter to the editor uh, rebutting you, but now you could be subject to an avalanche of online criticism that can be very intimidating, that very often sort of seems to flow into you know, real vitriol, death threats, and sort of a, a censorious escalation of battles over speech. So that's one part of it. You know, another aspect is that on the internet, you know, I have a whole chapter about intent and context. And, and the trouble with speech on the internet is it's so often divorced from context and impossible to know the intent. So things get snipped out, excerpted, they can travel all over the world to audiences that were, that were never intended by the speaker and be interpreted any which way. And it, it can be very difficult uh, and, and sort of cumbersome to try to figure out what the intent was. And people who are reacting to the speech very often, you know, really don't bother. And if something sort of seems to fit into their preconceptions or, you know, makes them intuitively, instinctively angry, they'll just react to it and sort of jump right into that fray. And the, that process of sort of, sort of sorting out What's the intent? What's the context? What's the culpability? And what's an appropriate reaction? Really is short circuited, and and that's what fuels these online dust ups. Let's stick with this idea of context for a minute, because another quote from your book that really spoke to me was the imperative of excoriating the content of objectionable opinion. Uh, ex sorry, I'm going to start again. Um, the imperative of excoriating the content of objectionable opinions can seem far more compelling than the virtue of defending a speaker's right to voice them. Social media can incentivize voicing indignation over a post without taking the time to read it. Can you talk a little bit about that, the way in which the very nature of, of success in social media in some ways works against the kind of contextualization and even-mindedness that you're advocating for? Yeah, I think what it does is, you know, if you're trying to build a following on social media, you want to signal pe to people that you uphold a certain set of values, that they can come to you for a particular viewpoint, that you can be trusted uh, as a kind of interlocutor with society and an interpreter of events. And I think the the impulse and the incentive is really to display that at all times and also to move very, very quickly. So, uh, you know, the minute you see something to react, have the hot take, you know, offer the pithy, witty, incisive interpretation of what's gone on. And, you know, 
sometimes that ends up being wrong. And, you know, that give an example in a book about a woman who saw, you know, a, a customs officer and, and a, a tattoo that he had and, and thought it was a, an iron cross, kind of a neo-Nazi symbol. And she quickly tweeted about it and, you know, only to discover, no, this was a tattoo that related to the platoon in which he had served in Afghanistan and he was a veteran and so she was excoriated for uh, the misinterpretation and I think you know it was really a function of speed and sort of wanting to you know the idea that this would be so incendiary if a border patrol agent displayed such a tattoo that she wanted to be sort of the person who brought that to the world and I think that incentive structure which emphasizes speed sort of novelty pithiness, uh, you know, is it makes for vibrant discourse, yes, and that's why Twitter is compelling and huge and people spend all day on it, but it really does cut against an effort at reasoned discourse. It's sort of difficult to have a deliberate, considered back and forth, you know, instead of, uh, you know, posting that item and saying, you know, what is this? What does this look like? Does anyone know without sort of outing the individual? You know, that might have been a way to do it, but nobody has time for that or that, you know, that doesn't captivate the audience the way that the accusation does. And so I think we have to sort of discipline ourselves to cut against that where we can. One thing I really appreciate about the way your book is constructed is that you you create sort of a digest of each chapter in a way. It has a, almost a how-to quality, which I've personally found incredibly helpful. I think many of us feel a bit helpless in this context, and especially because one wrong move, as you've just pointed out, one mistake can be so costly. Can you talk a little bit about how, what, what sort of a, a actual practical advice you can give us as, as social media users, and at this point, fewer and fewer people are not on social media, what are some ways that we can work against this kind of inherent uh, conflict between social media success and comfortable free speech for all? Yeah, you know, I mean, I sort of start off the book talking about conscientiousness with language. And, you know, I think that's sort of an obligation that we all have to assume if we want to keep free speech free, that we need to be considered in how we phrase and frame things. And that even if you, you know, didn't get the memo about a term that is now considered offensive, because things move quickly and you may not always be on top of it. You know, if you have any doubt, check with someone or Google it, you know, if it occurs to you, maybe this is offensive, you know, type it into Google and see what comes up. You know, if you're writing about a population that you're not part of, if you're writing about black people or Latinx or the disabled, there are lexicons that show you what terms are considered offensive and how to rephrase those ideas. So I think the important thing is, you know, is dare to speak, that you need to be committed to try to get across the viewpoint or the opinion that you hold or that you want to convey, but doing it in a considered and thoughtful way, taking some, you know, pretty easy steps, like most of, much of this can be done, you know, by a, a couple of quick Google searches to make sure that you don't accidentally step across the line, because, you know, it, it's a very fluid culture on social media where, you know, the, the meaning of a phrase, uh, you know, a year ago may not be the meaning now. And there is sort of an expectation that if you're in that fray, that you're keeping abreast of all that. You use a, a, um, a term, duty of care, which I found really kind of interesting and helpful. And it seems like in a way what you're talking about now is, is part of that. Can you define duty of care and talk a little bit about that concept and how it's useful to us both, or can be useful both as speakers and as listeners? Sure, I mean, it really has to do with how we evaluate sort of the, the culpability or the accountability that is appropriate for offensive speech and the idea that if you have a larger platform or a position of authority, you bear a heavier duty in speaking out. So if you're the president of a university, something that, you know, might be okay if it were said by a, a student, you know, may not be acceptable when you articulate it because it's seen as a reflection of the values of the institution. Or if you're 
Megyn Kelly and you're just riffing informally about blackface as a Halloween costume, like actually when you have your own show and you have a team of researchers, you know, it sort of is incumbent on you to have recognized that that sort of costume has become extremely contentious and offensive. And there've been many instances where it's clear that it really upsets people to so, so to speak about it as if it's to, you know, totally acceptable or uh, no big deal is, is less excusable or forgivable than it would be you know, for an ordinary citizen who doesn't have that platform, who doesn't have that level of support. I also think when you're venturing into topics that you know less about, you have a heightened duty of care to do your research and to not speak off the cuff to make sure perhaps you've consulted with people from the group that you're going to be talking about or you've looked into the history so that you know you, you don't accidentally misspeak. And and so you know the, the basic idea is depending on the setting, that duty of care varies. Because I also think it's important, look, we don't want our dinner table conversation to be constricted by this sense that we all bear this heavy burden of conscientiousness and we really have to think so uh, meticulously before we speak out, there should be settings that are informal where you know you can ask a question that might be a little edgy or might reveal ignorance. We need settings where we can do that as well. And so it's a question of calibrating the duty of care depending on your position and the setting you're in. You also compellingly talk about the, the duty of care in terms of trying to evaluate the severity of a transgression uh, or a perceived transgression. And I wonder if you could actually talk about the example of the Harvard professor who um, chose to defend Harvey Weinstein. And you describe that as a case where the duty of care possibly really had not been violated and yet the repercussions were severe. Yeah, it's Ronald Sullivan, who's a law school professor and was also serving as a dean of a residential college at Harvard undergrad. And when it became known that he was part of Harvey Weinstein's defense team, students in the undergraduate college objected to his presence there, saying that it made them feel unsafe for somebody who was taking the side of you know this sexual predator who you know now is convicted at the time wasn't but it was quite clear from the moment the New York Times broke the story about Weinstein that you know he had this unbelievable pattern of abuse of women and so the objection was was that Sullivan had any was going to have any part in that defense it was a sense that that was incompatible with playing the role of creating a welcoming, hospitable environment for undergrads at the college. And, you know, to me, that was a real problem because, you know, it, it, it's the role of a law professor to take on contentious cases. And, you know, there are other professors who, you know, defended people that, you know, really are, are questionable. We believe in this country that everybody has the right to a strong defense. Even if you're a mass murderer, you still are entitled to competent, capable, legal representation, and if your case raises novel issues, you want strong legal minds to be making those arguments and just ensuring that the legal result comes out right. So, you know, this, Ronald Sullivan had defended people who are on death row who, you know, were convicted murderers. And I don't think anyone ever thought that disqualified him from serving in a residential college because he was somebody who condoned murder. And so I think in the same way, his involvement in the Weinstein case as a, a law professor and a legal expert should not have been read to imply indifference to the problem of sexual assault. And there wasn't any suggestion that he actually had been indifferent in practice, that he had ignored reports or, or, or not acted appropriately in response to incidents. So, you know, for me, that was an example of somebody being, and he was removed from his position because of those student objections. And, and, and in my view, the, the, the university should have stood by him. And there should have been a dialogue with students about the nature of their concerns, what under, underwrote them. You know, this is a, a time during the Me Too movement where people are coming forward with stories as never before. And these issues were at the foreground ground and it's important to listen to women's voices and hear out those students but I think there could have been a better resolution that would have allowed them to feel a sense of confidence in his continued leadership without you know exacting you know what amounted to sort of a, a punishment for his decision to get involved in the, in the Weinstein case. 
And you've done, at, at Pan America, you've uh, initiated and spearheaded a tremendous involvement in, ca in campus speech, which I think in a way this example really speaks to. A conflict between students saying that they feel unsafe um, and, and uh, professors who may or may, may have made a mistake, or in this case, maybe were just doing their jobs. Can you talk a little bit about how the campus, how you have approached this issue at Pan America and what kinds of, of work the Campus Free Speech Initiative has undertaken? Yeah, sure. I mean, to me, it really originated in a seminar I attended some years ago of a group of free speech experts who were gathering. It was actually at Wellesley College. It was right at the time where the flare-ups at Yale and the University of Missouri around issues of race and free expression were making headlines. And there was a sense among these free speech experts that students were censorious and that this kind of outrage over, you know, the Yale case, which I talk about in the book, over a memo about Halloween costumes, you know, reflected a young generation that was politically correct to the nth degree, that couldn't tolerate any discomfort, that, uh, you know, was willing to resort to censorship at the drop of a hat in response to speech that they found ob objectionable or discomforting. And a student sort of raised her hand. She was the student body president at Wellesley at the time. And, and she's actually the person who introduced to me the kind of concept of conscientiousness. And she sort of said, you know, what's wrong with asking for a degree of conscientiousness if it makes students feel more at home, more welcomed on campus. And there was something about the way she put it that was so genuine that for me kind of unlocked something, which was the idea that these students are really driving toward a more equal, inclusive, and just campus. And that's actually a very good thing. They want to dismantle the legacy of racism. Let's face it, these institutions you know, were created by and for white men generations ago and they, they've adapted in a lot of ways but many of their traditions and norms still are vestiges from that era and there is more work to do as we all know to eradicate systemic racism whether it's on campus or in society so my view was to the extent that that's what students are trying to do we really need to hear them out and respect that and that it's, it's important though that they not believe that the accomplishment of those goals requires restricting free speech or academic freedom. And you know, it's always been my strong view that the values of equity and inclusion and robust protection for free speech on the other side can and must be reconciled. And that's really been the premise of our work on campus free speech. And so we're not, you know, some free speech experts I think tend to be a little bit dismissive of the rising generation and its penchant at times for censoriousness. And I think you know, that's a little bit, you know, not the most constructive approach. I think a better approach is to sort of hear them out, uh, focus on the underlying concerns that are driving them, which really are not about curbing free speech, but rather about protecting people from vulnerable groups, you know, unearthing and digging out legacies of racism and sexism and eradicating them. And, you know, a, a number of goals and values that I think we can all subscribe to. And so the key is to demonstrate how they are compatible with robust protections for free speech. It seems that in a way, a lot of the, um, a lot of the decision making in a case like this really falls to the institution in question, whether it's a newspaper, a university, and your book offers guidance for institutions in trying to navigate what often appears to actually be a, a almost irreconcilable conflict between equality and freedom of speech. Can you talk a little bit about how institutions can, can navigate this difficult terrain more successfully? Yeah, sure. I mean, one key element, when we first got involved in this work on campuses, you know, you'd hear instances of a professor you know, using a slur maybe in a pedagogical context in class, and the university would sort of throw up their hands and say, well, free speech, there's nothing we can do. And what we said was, well, that's not, really the case. Yes, you may need to protect that individual and avoid disciplining them uh, or investigating them uh, in a way that is punitive. But at the same time, if they said something that 
is widely recognized as offensive, the university is perfectly within its rights to articulate its own values and say, look, that's a perspective that we reject and we you know, value the presence of all students on campus. You know, there was a, a Penn Law professor who you know, made derisive remarks about black students. And you know, I think the university responded appropriately. They distanced themselves unequivocally from her comments and, you know, in fact, actually uh, uh, took her away from teaching first year students so that students would have the choice about of whether or not to take her classes. Uh, you know, but they, so they defended her, but also distanced themselves convincingly from her comments. And so sometimes an, an institution needs to play that dual role. And, I, you know, I think institutions also have a role to play in educating people about free speech and why we protect it. And, you know, often that's sort of overlooked, I think, in civics classrooms across the country in elementary and secondary education that has fallen away. And so while, you know, one good thing is that most Americans, including students, will still say in a survey that they like the idea of free speech, oftentimes they really don't know much about what's entailed. And so it can be useful for the institution to spend time in a freshman orientation educating students about you know why it is that we have academic freedom and why it is that you're going to hear some things that are offensive and while we may respond robustly to that speech we're not going to ban or punish it i feel like that's so important and i'm actually going to read a quote from the book that, that speaks to that because i feel that we have taken on an almost binary mode of thought here where equality and free speech have been pitted against each other but you you write Quote, the quest for a diverse, inclusive society is in fact fortified by the defense of free speech. And the case for free speech is more credible and more persuasive when it incorporates a defense of equality as well. Can you spend another minute, just because this is really in a way counter to the, the, the way many of us have come to think about these issues, on how they actually can strengthen and fortify each other? Sure. I mean, when you think about the quest for equality and the vindication of the rights of minorities and dissenters and people who are otherwise shunted to the margins of society, free speech is an incredibly powerful tool and catalyst for that. And if you look historically at the kinds of speech that have been suppressed, you know, it was women's rights advocacy and, you know, Margaret Sanger advocating for reproductive rights. You know, Martin Luther King uh, being jailed for protesting peacefully. And, you know, the, the, if by empowering government to suppress free speech, you know, what are they going to suppress? Challenges to their authority. And those are going to be very often from, you know, members of groups that are disempowered or excluded. And so I actually believe those who are out of power or at the margins have the strongest stake, you know, of any of us in free speech protections because it's, it, it guarantees their right to agitate and push and demand reform uh, and, and the reinvention of society. And you know, we saw this on the streets of our cities just over the last couple of months when people took to the streets demanding police reform and the eradication of systemic racism, you know, authorities clamped down on them and uh, you know, rubber bullets and tear gas, uh, arrests of journalists who are trying to tell the story. And, you know, that's what happens. And if, if, if we didn't have our First Amendment protections that in most instances at least put, put the brakes on those infringements on protest rights, you know, we wouldn't have what we have now, which is this powerful momentum for transformation in our society where you have state houses and city councils and even the U.S. Congress uh, enacting and, and, and debating proposals for dramatic reform. So I think that's sort of an explanation of how the quest for equality depends on free speech rights. You know, free speech, on the other hand, I believe, you know, absolutely needs to embrace uh, e equality in order to be realized. I mean, we go back to the benefits of free speech that we talked about at the beginning, the quest for truth, the dynamism and creativity in society, the fulfillment of individual autonomy, all of those are compromised if you have segments of society, whether it's women or blacks or immigrants or the disabled who are shut out of our discourse because they don't have education, they don't have platforms, they don't have opportunities and careers like publishing or journalism that give them access to audiences and the opportunity to 
to persuade and be heard. And so I believe passionately that defenders of free speech need to work to dismantle barriers of exclusion and to foster a more equal society so that those rights can be enjoyed by all. You talk too about individual responsibility for protecting free speech. And one aspect of that is to speak up even when it might be scary to do so. And we've talked about all kinds of reasons that that fear exists. It's social media, lack of context, it, you know, disproportionate consequences potentially. Um, but you write, while it may be instinctive to clam up when you suspect your opinions put you in the minority, the robust defense of free speech demands speaking up at precisely these moments. Can you talk about how that can make a difference? Sure. I mean, you know, so often something that is catalytic for society you know, originates as a heresy. You know, and I give the example of Tani C. Coates' piece in The Atlantic, The Case for Reparations, which you know, I think before it was published, that was considered you know, an idea that sort of mainstream society would never entertain, and it was radical and out of bounds. And yet he marshaled his case very persuasively. And you, know, you now have a lot of support for a congressional commission to look into that idea. You have cities that are taking matters into their own hands, Asheville, North Carolina, implementing their own version of that idea. And so I think recognizing that, you know, within a dissenting view or a minority opinion may be a, a kernel or a nugget of something that the broader conversation really ought to encompass is extremely important. And if all of us just sort of think the better of it and take the easy route and just avoid bucking the consensus, you know, those ideas will never come to the foreground. And I, you know, I also think we need to support one another. I think when someone does summon the courage to speak up in a way that is contrarian, that even if others don't agree with them, you know, there are ways of supporting and creating space for that dialogue. And it's a richer dialogue. I mean, if all of us preemptively self-censor and you know just hone in on what we think is you know the lowest common denominator of agreement that we really lose out on those benefits of free speech that we talked about you know that kind of robust give and take and exchange that leads to leads to truth seeking you know and i feel like it, there's kind of an analogy between this what you're talking about right now and freedom of the imagination which is something that's very important to me as a fiction writer especially as a fiction writer who does not write about my own life i'm not someone who i i can't i don't draw any inspiration from my own life and i i like to in fact writing fiction for me is a way of escaping from my own consciousness and my own experience so i'm I am always writing about people who are different from myself and have watched with a kind of fear as that possibility seems to culturally become more and more dangerous. And you quote Toni Morrison in your book in a, a quote that was just thrilling to me, which I'm gonna read. When I taught creative writing, quote, when I taught creative writing at Princeton, at Princeton, my students had been told all their lives to write what they knew. I always began the course by saying, don't pay any attention to that. Think of somebody you don't know. What about a Mexican waitress in the Rio Grande who, can't, who can barely speak English? Or what about a grand madam in Paris? Things way outside their camp, imagine it, create it. That's Toni Morrison. <laughs> it was thrilling for me to read that, and yet, yeah, I think about the controversy over American Dirt, which was just this past spring. Can you talk about how your book and some of the issues that it raises can help fiction writers to understand what we are and are not permitted to write about? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think you have to recognize there's a couple things at work. And, you know, one is sort of even the fact that she was teaching at Princeton. You know, who was sitting in that classroom at Princeton? You know, it was people who had all the advantages you know that that sort of got them into that position and so i think the question people are asking is you know what about someone who's closer to the life experience of that wait waitress on the rio grande in, in mexico you know does that person have the opportunity to tell their own story and very often you know the answer is 
No, because they, they don't have the education or the access, uh, you know, or even the chance to be that voice of their own community. And so I think the kind of historic legacy of racism and privilege as it affects publishing though, has led to this demand that people, that we create more on-ramps and more opportunities for writers from all kinds of different backgrounds to be able to partake in publishing and you know, even get big advances and, and major support from publishing houses, which has been hard to access. And I think that is a legitimate demand, but it, it has sometimes crossed over into an insistence that those who are, are, are writing about a group not their own, you know, must be silenced, you know, because uh, that imbalance exists and, and their very work is sort of a, a manifestation or even an exacerbation of it. So I, you know, I think the answer is sort of twofold. I think we do need a much more dramatic effort to examine pathways to access for opportunities in publishing. And, you know, we know it's a very, it remains a very white elite industry and that there hasn't been uh, drastic change over many years. And, you know, the same is true in journalism. I talked in the book about, you know, how, how long it's taking to diversify newsrooms and how goals that were set decades ago have persistently been missed. And so I think a much more intensive, serious uh, investment is needed to affect that transformation. And that in so doing, you can also protect this essential freedom of the imagination that Toni Morrison articulates, where people are, are not confined to writing about, you know, only certain topics or what they know. I also think there's a, there is a heightened kind of conscientiousness that has taken hold where if you are writing about a population that you don't know, and particularly, you know, you, you write sometimes, you know, historical fiction, you know, I think is evaluated a bit differently. But if you're writing today about a minority population that you're not part of, I think there is a sense that you've got to do your homework and research that carefully, that you want to have readers from diverse backgrounds who give you a sense of how audiences may react to this ahead of time. And, you know, I think that works. You know, there's some fear that that becomes censorious in of itself, but I don't think it has to. And, you know, I find with some of my writing, it's extremely useful to show it to a whole variety of people because they have reactions that I don't foresee. They see things that I don't pick up on that readers will see. And, you know, sometimes it may be something I want a reader to see, and sometimes it may be that I've phrased something suboptimally and I want to be more, you know, more precise or use different wording. So, I think those are the elements. It, it's a difficult moment now because the diversification in publishing is lagging behind. And so it's sort of the, 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 the frustration over that is sometimes manifesting in this insistence that, you know, stories that are written by people other than, you know, from a particular group are illegitimate. Right. That makes sense. And I, I mean, I have to say, as someone who's kind of written outside of my own experience always, I feel like some of this is just kind of common sense. I mean, if you're writing from a male viewpoint, for example, as I do a lot, you'd sure as hell better have some, a lot of male readers reading this before it gets published. It's not in that case so much about, you know, being accused of insensitivity as just getting it wrong and doing a bad job. Um, so I think, I think maybe there's a way in which some of this will um, become more second nature uh, to, to writers. You talk a lot in the book about, and, and I, this really touched me and kind of spoke to me, just the importance of forgiveness and compassion and the willingness to tolerate mistakes as all of us move into hopefully a more just and equal world in which more people are able to express themselves freely. Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe connect it back to social media? Because I think sometimes it's in that context where we are most lacking compassion and forgiveness. This is something, you know, particularly kind of at this moment, there, there can be a bit of a feeling that given the backdrop of racism and sexism and inequality that we need a kind of zero tolerance for offense or even the unintentional slight and that only by exhibiting a really strong power potent reaction by society of upset over that will people be 
kind of chastened enough to change the way they think and speak. And, you know, I think there are occasions where that's appropriate, where somebody in a position of great authority, you know, uh, whether it's a political leader or an institutional leader, says something that, you know, they really needed to have known was deeply offensive, uh, you know, and they kind of step into it and they do it anyway. And it's a kind of a reckless, wanton disregard for social norms and taboos and the importance of showing respect to different groups. But so much of the time, you know, these, these incidents fall far short of that. And, you know, we ha are dealing with generational differences, regional differences, cultural differences, where people, you know, don't quite get, you know, how you ought to talk about uh, a certain issue now. And they kind of misspeak, they blunder, you know, they are anachronistic in how they talk. And, you know, yet if you interrogate the intent and the context, you know, there's often no malice, you know, often somebody who does not have a history of being, you know, anti-Semitic or uh, misogynistic or racist. And I think in instances like that, to be able to, you know, look at the person, the intent and the context and give some space, especially if the person is genuinely contrite. And I talk in the book about, you know, how to apologize and that, you know, there, there is a propensity to be very defensive when you're accused and to do what I describe as a, a pseudo apology, you know, which is really uh, about an accusation against the person who is coming after you and suggesting that, you know, they've got it all wrong or they're oversensitive. And so, yeah, I think that's a problem. But when an individual expresses genuine contrition and, you know, it's an isolated incident or it's something where the intent, uh, you know, seems to have, have been something quite different. I absolutely think we need room for forgiveness. You know, I also heard from people, which I understand that there there's, can be a, a an insistence that people from particular minority groups, like let's say Blacks, are asked to forgive all the time because people are making mistakes and, and microaggressing all the time. And they're expected to just kind of let all of this roll off of them as if it's nothing. I don't think that's fair either. You know, I think you also have to realize, look, the one person's mistake may be unintentional and forgivable, but on the receiving end, you know, this may be part of a pattern that someone has endured for their whole life and the cumulative effect of it on them, you know, may be very intense. And that makes it difficult to forgive, you know, even in an instance where forgiveness would seem warranted. So I think we have to take that into account as well and, and make sure, you know, if they see there's an effort to deal with the systemic issue and that it's not just being brushed by the wayside with, oh, you know, you've just got to forgive and forgive and forgive, uh, you know, each person who blunders in this way, you know, I think it, it becomes easier if they feel, people feel like, you know, their concerns are, are, are being taken seriously and there's some systemic effort to address them. I want to um, move back to kind of our current political moment for a minute. And you, you write, quote, the politicization of free speech represents a dangerous trend. And I immediately thought reading of, of that line about the politicization of, say, mask wearing. Um, you know, it's a public health necessity. And yet it has become in, infused with this kind of political um, aspect, in, at least in certain regions, that that are really, that have ultimately kind of devastating consequences for people who feel either unable to wear masks because they don't want to represent what that has come to mean politically. So can you talk a little bit about how the politiz politicization of free speech uh, has has worked and what its dangers are? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, we see a number of things. On campuses in particular, what I've witnessed is that students increasingly come to see free speech as sort of a right-leaning conservative cause, and they feel like free speech as a concept is invoked only in relation to speech they find offensive and menacing. And if, you know, I understand if you only hear free speech invoked in relation to slurs or nooses that are hung in trees or you know, derisive comments, you know, you're going to become skeptical of this idea. And I think that's what's happening. We see in surveys of young people that, you know, while they may believe in free speech, they also think it needs to be pared back or limited in various ways. And I think that's a real danger. That's been actually an important part of Penn's work is kind of coming out 
free speech on campus from an angle, you know, we're, we're a nonpartisan organization and, you know, we engage heavily with students on the left and most young people are more left leaning. So I think it's extremely important to frame the free speech arguments in ways that are going to appeal to a rising generation of students who are more progressive than their forebears. You know, and we also see at the political level and in the courts, you know, I, I talk about the study that shows, you know, this, this growing propensity, even at the Supreme Court for justices to uphold speech rights when it comes to speech with which they are politically aligned. And that propensity is more pronounced when it comes to conservative justices who are appointed by Republicans that, you know, over time, there's always been some tendency for justices to align uh, and be more uh, affirmative in, in, in defending speech rights, you know, when the underlying speech is, is speech they might agree with or that, uh, affiliate with politically, but that propensity has become much more pronounced over the last kind of decade or two. And it's worrying. I mean, my ultimate concern is that we risk losing a rising generation when it comes to the pre principle of free speech because they feel like it's, it's something that goes against their values, that it's not part of a social justice agenda. And I think it's extremely important for those who think they're defending free speech to really consider whether the ways they're doing it are in fact driving away, uh, you know, a, a, a generation of young people who support, you know, we're ultimately going to need if this principle is going to remain intact in our society. And yet you describe yourself as an optimist. And maybe we should close um, after some, uh, you know, a lot of discussions of challenges to free speech, and especially to me, the most concerning one, which is a, a, a generation that will ultimately be in power who may not recognize the value of it. What, what signs do you see that give you optimism for this issue? Yeah, you know, I think there are some sort of flip sides to look at. I mean, we talked about some of the downsides of social media. There are positive sides of social media. You know, social media has given the opportunity for just about anyone who has something to say to find a platform and potentially build an audience to do it. And so that's a great boon for free speech. You know, we also, in this moment of reckoning over anti-Black racism, you know, we've seen uh, and heard voices amplified that have never before been heard. We're seeing movement in publishing houses and newsrooms to diversify, to put new people in positions of leadership who are going to, you know, champion new kinds of stories and writers and I think help advance some of these challenges, addressing some of these challenges that we've been talking about. And, you know, I, I sort of do have some faith in this rising generation. I think their commitment to equality and inclusion and justice is quite moving and they're serious about going further than we've gone before and being more drastic uh, in how we remodel society to dismantle barriers. I think that's a very positive thing that ultimately is going to allow free speech to flourish because we'll have more people with access to more opportunities to express themselves. I also think they're learning how they're they are growing up in a much more diverse society than the one that existed a couple of generations ago. And they're learning how to navigate that with one another, how to talk to one another, uh, you know, how to be respectful, how to tackle difficult issues. You know, I talk a little bit in the book about some programs that I think advance that. One is debate, uh, which is something my kids have been involved with. And just, you know, watching them debate a whole range of really contentious issues and having to come to see that both sides of the argument have uh, important points to be to make and that it's worth hearing them out and that you can have a reasoned discussion about these issues. So, you know, I think ultimately the rising generation is going to sort of figure this out and that the benefits of free speech are going to be apparent to them, but we've got to kind of work through, we're in a kind of tectonic moment of tension and friction over these issues and my effort in the book is to sort of suggest how we can navigate through that to what I think will be a better place on the other end. I'm going to quote you one more time because I, this is another um, moment that really spoke to me. You write, quote, but for those who want to build an audience, advance a debate, or affect social change, it is essential to be able to communicate with and even convince 
those who do not start on your side. And I feel like that is just, for a, a generation that seeks greater social justice, you know, ultimately it, that, that uh, ability to persuade people who don't agree, who may be of a, ge a different generation, who are struggling to find their way into this more just world, um, I think your book really speaks to the necessity of being able to actually have a dialogue. And my hope is, you know, speaking as someone who has felt anxious about how to function in a world where, you know, making a mistake can be so costly, where freedom of the imagination is being questioned, I can just say that I found Dare to Speak a very, very useful tool. And I really hope that others will as well. Well, thank you so much. It was great to talk with you about all of this, and I enjoyed the questions a lot. Thank you. I, I look forward to to uh, having to seeing um, to seeing people read this and and be uh, educated by it. Before we close, Suzanne, I have uh, one question for you, and uh, this is both individually, and this certainly applies to you, to you as well, Jennifer, um, and also as as representing Penn. Um, what are some of the challenges when it when you're faced with defending speech which is free to put out there but you might not necessarily agree with um how, how can you how can you how, how do you de defeat that and and do that well enough as an organization and how do you how would you recommend those of us uh recognize the right to to say something even though we might disagree with it sure. i mean i think you know it goes back, uh, you know, to the 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 old expression of you know that uh, you know I I disagree fundamentally with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And I think it's being able to do those two things at the same time and to take on someone's speech on the merits and to engage with the substance and explain why you think it's wrongheaded, objectionable, even why it offends you, but without suggesting that they should be punished or silenced and you know i think also without doing it in a way that even if you're not formally calling for any kind of censure that nonetheless has a censorious effect for example mocking somebody on social media and and demeaning them because of what they've said you know, there might be some instances you know i talked about sort of when people are wanton or reckless in in their speech where you know, and they've misused a platform, like let's say a, a talk show host who says something really objectionable about a guest or makes a racist comment. You know, I think in that instance, a measure of public uproar is appropriate, but where, you know, it's an individual who has misspoken or blundered, I think there, there should be space for a more reasoned approach and the kind of veering into character assassination escalates matters and has a censorious effect, not just for the person who's on the receiving end, but for everybody else who's watching it, who's like, oh, you know, I don't want to you know, take the risk of speaking out or saying anything edgy because look at what can happen, you know, uh, if, if, if you, you simply say the wrong thing. So, you know, I think it, it, it's just a matter of trying to be reasoned in your expression. It doesn't always lend itself to social media. You know, one of the comments I've sort of uh, had about this book in recent weeks is, you know, with all of the controversy over the Harper's letter and Barry Weiss's resignation from the New York Times opinion page is that it sort of took me 20 principles because there's a lot, there's, there's kind of a lot of distinct things that you have to say, you know, almost in the same breath, like, you know, recognizing that speech can cause harm, recognizing that it's important to be conscientious with, with language, recognizing that uh, it's, ne it, it's necessary to protest speech, but without silencing it. And that kind of all these pieces need to fit together. And sometimes if you say just one part of it, uh, you know, like protest without silencing, and you haven't made the point that yes, you acknowledge speech can cause harm, you know, people kind of come after you because they assume, you know, you don't believe in the other pieces, which may not be true. Uh, but, but, you know, the reductionist nature of our discourse, particularly on social media, kind of cuts against that kind of nuance and, and sort of uh, expressing a, a considered view that, uh, you know, may, may address and preempt some of those criticisms. Thank you very much. I, oh, sorry. I, I could 
add one thing, which is that I always think of, um, I was writing an article about Catholic seminarians years ago when John Paul was still Pope. And I remember talking to a priest who was a professor at a Catholic university, and he was very conservative and, and very um, supportive of the Pope, but he strongly disliked the censoring that was coming out of Rome. Um, that the, there were problems of, of priests being fired or academics being fired for questioning some of the doctrines. And what he said was, if you don't let anyone question the doctrines, there, you, you can't keep the position healthy. That in some sense, you know, this back and forth, this, this conversation or debate is actually what helps to strengthen the health of one's own position. And so you, it has to be possible to do that or there's the danger that you just become so um, sort of locked inside your own uh, thought bubble or opinion bubble that in, in some way it no longer really holds water out there in the world. And so I found that very helpful. One last question in, in the course of either saying something that some, some might find objectionable or is plain old objectionable, the fast pace of social media is such that there is an immediate reaction that, that takes place out there. My question to you is, does Penn ever get involved in advising social media platforms? Have you ever been reached out to, to help them sort of rethink how, what role they should take in, in monitoring the content that goes out on their platforms? Yeah, we talk about that a lot. There's a couple of chapters in the book that are devoted to that. And yeah, there's sort of two sides to it. One is, I think we need to be leery of giving social media platforms unfettered authority to police speech. You know, they have their own motives and limitations. They're profit-making companies. They have their own political allegiances. You know, their leadership has certain viewpoints and objectives that are going to govern how they do it. And given the vast swaths of public discourse that they control, I think we have to be careful in saying that we want them to just willy-nilly clean up the platforms and do away with all speech that, you know, in their judgment shouldn't be there. And, you know, we also see in practice the way they do it is very flawed. You know, they rely on low-wage content moderators, they rely on artificial intelligence, and there are a lot of errors. You know, on the flip side, you know, obviously we've talked about this, we see that online speech has particular and devastating harms. And we didn't talk about things like cyberbullying or terrorist content or disinformation that can, dis can infect democracy. But there are all these types of content online that really can be damaging both at the individual level and the societal level. And we do need to be more aggressive in policing those. One of the things that I argue for in the book is a independent global digital content defender, which would basically be a mechanism that would ensure that as platforms become more aggressive in moderating content, which I think they have to do, and you know, people are insisting that they do it, there'll soon be legislation, I think, requiring them to do it, that we have a mechanism that protects against the inevitable false positives and the instances in which legitimate content, you know, maybe satire, maybe something that's been misinterpreted, it may be something that, you know, in context is perfectly legitimate, but that nonetheless triggers, uh, whether it's an AI filter or a human filter, uh, that the content ends up being taken down wrongfully. And I think we need a corrective that ensures that in those instances, expressive rights are upheld and that content can be quickly restored. And that involves social media companies being much more affirmative with their customer service than they are today. So we do engage with them pretty directly on a whole series of issues, including online harassment and disinformation. And, you know, there are no perfect answers. You know, they're, they're, they're getting that perfect equipoise where they're policing content just enough, but not too much is going to be impossible. It'll be a, a continued tussle and give and take to try to improve the systems. Thank you very much to both of you. Uh, thanks for joining us, Suzanne Nossel, and thank you, Jennifer Egan, for participating in the conversation. A reminder again, Suzanne's book is Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All, and it is available wherever books are sold and signed copies are available in the link in the comments. Thank you and have a good day.